as a journalist, what I do is storytelling. I try to get to the nugget of what is happening in someone's life. And if you can find an undertold story and really get to the why and understand someone, it can be incredibly powerful. I think as a philanthropist, I like to see myself as changing the story. I started the Soledad O'Brien Brad Raymond, my husband, foundation in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. We saw so many people who had lost everything. If you remember, the city was 80% underwater. Many people who were trying to come back, but come back to what? There were no stores. A lot of people had no jobs. Many schools were not even back. And I've spent much of my career covering disasters. And you always end up feeling the same. You cannot change what happened. You can only report on the story. But then, in Katrina, it kind of dawned on me, I could make some change. I could actually change the ending of the story for individuals. I could rewrite, if you will, some of these stories for specific girls who we would try to help. Alexia was our very first girl, my, my best friend and my executive producer at CNN at the time, uh, had a young woman who needed to figure out how to go to school. She wasn't a great student. She wasn't failing, but she wasn't an A. She was that average kid who was often sort of overlooked. The A's get great attention. Even the kids who are failing will get some attention. But the kid who sorts of, sort of floats along as a C often is overlooked. But we knew that if Alexia had the right support, she could go on to be a great student. And in fact, it could change her life because her family was in poverty. So we said yes to Alexia, and she became our first and only high school student. I meet girls now on assignment, girls that I was interviewing for black in America, for example, or Latino in America, girls who had potential. But when you would ask them, well, why are you not in college? Why are you sort of stuck where you are? They'd reveal some obstacle, poverty, maybe a small child that they had to stay home to take care of. And we recognized that money for tuition was critical, but it was really only part of the story. Our girls also needed mentors, champions, cheerleaders, and yes, they needed tuition as well. We began very ad hoc after Katrina, but three years ago we'd gotten so big that we hired an executive director, and today we send 25 girls from around the country to and through college, and we make sure they don't come off of our rolls until they're well ensconced in jobs, until we've actually changed the ending of their story. I'd like to tell you the story of one girl. Her name is Tierra Moore. I met her because a CNN colleague of mine was doing a story on the, the, raising, the rising of the, the rates, the tuition rates at the UC schools. And Tierra, who was a student at UCLA, said that she was $500 short per semester and was going to have to drop out of UCLA. So at the end of the interview, my colleague said, well, you might want to call Soledad. She started a foundation, and I got to know Tierra. Tierra's mother and father were getting divorced right before Tierra started uh, college at UCLA. And her father and uh, mother were fighting. The father tasered her mother and then set the house on fire. A neighbor ran in and rescued Tierra and her mom, and her father killed himself. And they were suddenly in poverty. Everything had been in his name. Tierra went off to UCLA working three jobs, commuting three hours each direction. Her mother also worked two jobs. And together, they lived in one bedroom in a friend's home. So Tierra, starting her junior year, when they raised tuition, $500 per semester was going to have to drop out. And that's when she came to me. We paid her tuition. We ended up helping her take some summer classes so she could get her second major. She won a fellowship at the end of her senior year. And when she decided that she actually wanted to go to law school to work with other people in poverty, my sister, who's a lawyer, ended up becoming her mentor. Tierra took the LSATs, did terribly, turned them back. We sent her to LSAT prep. And when she eventually applied to law school, she got into the nine law schools that she applied to and will head to Berkeley in the fall to start law school. This is a girl, remember, two years earlier, was about to drop out of college for $500 a semester. That's success. We've effectively changed her story. I'd like to play for you a little clip that we like to show our supporters about the work that we're doing and some of the girls that we impact. So if we could play that. Money is tight. 
I know sometimes my mom has to decide between paying the rent or paying the light bill. And Ursuline's an expensive school. Yes, it is. So, yeah, she has a lot to worry about. I feel sad for her. You do? I try not to ask for too much. I was surprised because I was, when I found out I was pregnant with Jalen, I was already two months and I didn't know, so. How old were you? 16 when I found out I was pregnant. Sometimes I can't even see my future. There's still days when I'm like, I feel like I'm at a standstill. I mean, even though I'm going to school and taking care of my son, I just feel like I'm still getting nowhere. The question at NYU was 50,000 a year, about 50 a year. So you got a scholarship for, for 25? Right, 25 was my scholarship. Did you love it? I loved New York. I loved just the atmosphere being there. I loved my dorm, I loved everything about it. Then, I mean, money got tight, but it, it, was, all, it was always tight from day one. So um, I guess I, I kind of felt it coming to an end, but it was kind of like, I didn't know what else to do to stop it. Where's your mom? My mom's in California. She left. Did she tell you she was leaving? She just moved to California? Yes. I initially came from a very comfortable middle income background, um, but things changed when I was 16. My mother and stepfather um, filed for a divorce, and uh, towards the end of that year, um, my stepfather uh, committed suicide um, and burned down our home, and that changed our financial um, stability. I guess with Naya, one of the things that really struck me was that we were able to change her life, you know, that this was a young woman with a son who you could look out and see what her future would be. Where I come from, people don't really go to school. They don't have college educations. So it was like, seeing it even happen for me. I'm not even 25 yet. I'll be done with college in like a year. Tell me what that scholarship has done for you. You don't know me firsthand, you don't know my experiences. But to trust me and, you know, and it's, it's, so, it's also it's so important, like, I'm at school and I'm like, okay, I can't just do it for myself, I have to do it for the scholarship too. I have to make these people proud, I have to, and it's so nice to do that, it's like very rewarding. We're so proud of you. It's so funny to hear your side of it, because my side of it is like, here's a girl who is busting her ass to make this work. I want her around my kids. I want my kids to see if you want something, if you really want it, you can do it. We have tried to create a, a foundation that has a family feel to it. And it is, it includes, obviously Soledad and I, it includes our kids, it includes a lot of our friends. And that's per, part of the reason for that is that we want to give the foundation a family feel. And we think that will um, allow us to be more inf impactful with the girls that we are, we are working with. I think we knew that if you could jump in at the right moment, you really could take someone who was heading this direction and move their life this way. I think I'm blessed. That's what I think. I think God being with me most of the time and have put the right people on my, around me. And Maria crossed the Rio Grande in a, with, a, with an inner tube. She can't swim. And her story of how she came to this country ended up in a detention center, eventually was able to get her visa, and recently got her green card. This is a young woman who, at the worst moments in detention uh, in Miami, would say, you know, but I'm focusing on my homework because it helps me keep my mind off on how bad my life is. I report on the stories, and often they're bad stories. Often they're stories where disasters have happened, terrible things have happened, bad statistics have happened, and you're following someone's life. Um, but in this case, we can make a difference. We can change the end of the story. If you're in advertising, then you know, at the end of the day, the story is everything. And yes, we're paying tuition, and yes, we're helping girls navigate college. But our real success is in changing their stories. The story that they think they have is one of struggle and chaos, of always being behind on their bills, of never really succeeding. 
we help them realize that all of that is actually the story of their success. It makes them stronger, it makes them more resilient, it makes them better able to get through life. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's something to inspire other girls. Our girls' stories, if you heard them all, would break your hearts. I could tell you about Paige, whose mom was killed in Newtown, Connecticut, in the school shooting. I could tell you about Terry, who you saw in that clip, whose mother abandoned her and just moved to California after Hurricane Katrina. Or Erica, who was attending school for a semester and then would drop out to work to try to make some money, and then re-enroll and attend school for another semester, and then drop out to try to make some money. But their real stories are the stories of what they are becoming. We call our foundation the Soledad O'Brien Brad Raymond Starfish Foundation because of a story that I was told when I was doing a documentary uh, in Haiti. It was terrible, post-earthquake, terrible. I mean, I can't even put to words the things that we would see, which was usually a lot of babies dying right after the earthquake every day. And I was doing a story on a bunch of missionaries, and they were always so hopeful. The missionaries I was working with had 56 orphans in their care. And there are something like 450,000 orphans in Haiti. And I thought, how can you do this job day in and day out? The other orphanages that we go visit, children were dying. And I remember opening the, the back of a, a box truck, and inside were 25 infants, all swaddled still. And they were all sick because they would feed them rice and milk mush, which, of course, infants can't digest that. So they'd get sick, but they had no water. So they were trying to keep them alive. And I said to this missionary, who was the focus of our, our documentary, like, how do you do this? You have a passport. You could just get out of here. And you've got 56 orphans in a sea of 450,000, and there's no light at the end of the tunnel. And she said to me, well, so that, it's the starfish story. I was like, what's a starfish story? I never heard of it. She said, you know, the starfish story. A boy is walking along the beach, and the tide's gone out, and all the starfish have been beached on the sand. And so he starts picking up starfish and chucking them back into the water. And a man comes up to him and says, what are you doing? This beach goes on for miles. This is a complete waste of your time. And the kid picks up a starfish and says, well, I guess it matters to this one, and chucks it in. And the missionaries use that story to help them understand why they're there doing what is really the impossible. And in a way, it's what we thought about our foundation. We're not helping a million girls. We help 25 at a time. But what we're trying to do is change their lives, chuck them back into the ocean as our little starfish, because a single one does matter. When I decided to leave CNN last month um, to focus on long-form stories and documentaries, we named my production company Starfish Media Group because it's that story that resonates, that connects us, that we can affect and impact and change. It's the story we buy into. It's a story that makes us feel despair or the story that gives us hope and opportunity and engagement. Through our girls, we're telling a story of success, stories about what happens when people intervene to make the change and change the world for deserving young women. And it's a great opportunity. And Gail, I thank you personally for your support and knowing that over the next months and years, we'll have an opportunity to work more with the Advertising Research Foundation. We've been incredibly grateful for the support of some of your members, the sponsors that we have. You may have seen their names at the end of our clips. They've understood that we're building and telling stories of success for this young women. Target's been a huge supporter, and in addition to uh, the tremendous support they give us for tuition, you know the thing that made the girls absolutely fall apart with joy? One year they rolled out suitcases for each girl, telling them, we know you're going places, you're going to need this. They couldn't be contained. We are grateful to Google, who has set up Google Hangouts for all of our girls so that they can talk among each other, amongst each other, and also we set them up with conversations with advisors as well, because we know that they need to empower themselves. So I'm very grateful for the time this afternoon as I stand in the way before your lunch starts. I appreciate a few moments to talk about what I'm trying to do in storytelling, and I know I'll have the opportunity over the next months and years ahead to connect with more of you. So thank you very much. For any more information, you're welcome to check us out at O'BrienRaymondFoundation.org. And thank you.